have a liner function or a line basically that uh, I find that uh, the distance is from 0 to 170 in the microcontroller so that's one end and this is the other end and then I find that the servo can go up to 130 and down to 45 I think so I did some math to find this this line this function so the thing is what I'm doing is that um, uh, whenever this pole is on this side the servo will move it up like this and then when the pole is on this side <coughs> the function will try and do this so you can see that when I turn it on there's a very slight movement in the beginning as you saw in the earlier video here in the background uh, <laughs> the gain was too high that means this moved too much up and down so the ball never stopped and also now it's, it doesn't really stop so and, and I think maybe as you can see here it's moving for every step it's moving quite a lot and since we are not going to well now it stops actually and since uh, this thing is doesn't have to move that much to move the ball then maybe you can uh, you can move this longer in on this arm and therefore the servo has to move longer right so therefore you get a uh, sort of higher resolution then because then you use more steps to get the same angle a uh, change in angle so yeah I will do that I will uh, drill a hole here and move this rod uh, longer in this arm and see what happens Okay, so this has been recorded a little bit later, but uh, that's okay. I drilled a new hole there, and uh, now it doesn't move as far as it used to. That means that every step is smaller. So, so the whole thing isn't bouncing around so much. I wish this ball was more perfectly round because it seems to be bouncing a little bit on the edge because there's two halves that are glued together. Anyway, it's okay though. There it stops again. It's about 91 to 94. So 91 to 94 is that position. First of all, I would like to have a look at servo signaling and how that works let's say this can move only in this direction these points, between these points and this will be the lower point and this will be the upper point so you have a fixed range the thing here is that you have a duty cycle um, in the signal it's basically a square wave like this and then it repeats so out here you have 20 millisecond and here you have 1 millisecond and 0 so this part here this is whenever the duty cycle or DS duty cycle is uh, the percentage of uh, the whole pulse and this pulse so so let's say 20 millisecond is everything then uh, 1 millisecond is the duty cycle so and then the survey is down here and as you move move this duty cycle here then you also move the servo and the other point here, this is 2 milliseconds. So, if you let it fall down higher up here, then it will move higher. Like this. So 
so I have uh, three methods. The first one I did was just to get things up and running. And this is not a good way of programming, but I will do it sometimes just to have something working at once. It's very fast and uh, it uh, involves using delays. So let's say we have this pose here. And I'm drawing it sideways and it repeats itself. Right? So here you have the. Here, you in your program, you set out to be high, and here you set it to be low. And in the meantime, you have a delay uh, that is between 1 and 2 milliseconds. And here you have a delay for let's say 19 milliseconds. It doesn't have to be exactly 50 hertz. So 20 milliseconds, 50 hertz actually. What's the negative thing then? Well, it's 100% uh, CPU. 100% CPU usage. The only way for the CPU to be accessed is via interrupts. So if you have interrupts, then you can uh, jump out of this routine. But uh, if you do that, then um, <laughs> let's say your program is running here and you get an interrupt, it will stop until the interrupt has been serviced. So you can then get jitter. So you never know where the interrupt comes, right? So this length can then bump around. <laughs> so, but anyway, this is not a good way because you are uh, stopping the program basically all the time. And then there's another one that is actually recommended, but I haven't used it. And I'll get to about that. And that's uh, timer interrupts. So. Basically, we use a timer that will tell the processor that now it's time to set the output high. And then you reset the timer for a period to set the to tell the process now it's time to set the output low again. So you can have your program running to do something completely else and then just interrupt it when uh, the timer tells it to interrupt so yeah so let's talk a little bit about timers before we get into that so let's talk about timers what is it it's a digital counter and a peripheral to the CPU core and uh, what that means is that it runs in parallel it runs in parallel to the CPU so this is an independent device. So imagine you have your CPU here, and it has its uh, RAM, a memory, and it buses as a bus, right? So that can access. And there's all sorts of stuff in there, like uh, um, accumulator and uh, yeah, all sorts of stuff and this is buzzing away but while this is buzzing away you have modules on the side for example for example IO we can have a timer uh, more timers and you have more stuff 
So these things, they uh, run uh, in parallel to the CPU, so... So, yeah, um, we can draw, can draw the timer like this. And uh, let's say this is a 8-bit uh, timer, so the time goes this way, and then it repeats. So let's say this is an 8-bit. Then usually they call it timer 0. So this is a register you can access, actually. So we'll get into that. So what does it do? It fires. Okay, let's see. Interrupts. On 0. So up here, you get an interrupt. Remember, this one is uh, running freely. You can stop it actually whenever you want. So, and the timer is actually just a register, like this. It can be any number in there, eight bit number, because it's an eight bit register. So this is timer zero and it's accessible in the code. You can set it whenever you want. So if you set this value, the timer will then jump to wherever you set it. Right. So here you have uh, step one, step two, so the clock is ticking. So and so on. And up here you have two fifty five. There is zero again. So, what we want to do now is to uh, utilize this uh, interrupt. So what we do, we um, we set our timer zero such that it has, say, we want it to delay for 90 milliseconds. Okay, then we set the timer up here such that it has 19 milliseconds left. But what if you, what happens if you do this? This is a value in here somewhere. Um, you lose uh, when you whenever your program interrupts, and then you want to service that interrupt to put the timer up here. The timer is still ticking while you are in the interrupt routine because it has to handle. Uh, uh, stuff in the interrupt, I don't know, like checking what interrupt it was, and time is ticking. So what you do, you don't do this. You do this instead. You take the full period, and then you subtract 19 milliseconds from that. And then you add that back to timer zero. So you take whatever is in timer zero, so let's say timer zero is up here. And then you add uh, a full revolution minus 19 milliseconds. So if your timer has ticked over here, then if you add the time value that is here with this, then it will end up here. So you never lose any ticks if you just add them. So this one actually is bad and this one is good. <laughs> And there's another module in here, so I can show you that before we get back, but this is for the one we are actually going to use, so there's another register or AND module. So let's draw timer 0 once again. So this is our register for timer 0. And remember, this one is counting continuously. So these numbers are increasing. Then you have something called compare. Compare. And in that compare register you have a value you can access. So, I don't remember exactly what this is called, but uh, it's called capture or something. Low something like that. So you can access this part. So if you set a value in here, let's say uh, 
1110111 and the thing is since this is running freely completely in parallel to the CPU independently then this value here it's compared with this and whenever this match then it will fire and interrupt so you can have your you can have your um, microcontroller interrupted for every is that it interrupts here as usual so now you can interrupt here at zero as usual but then you can have another interrupt let's say here with a ccp1l one whenever timer zero matches whatever you put in here it will fire another interrupt or you can stop it before it get to 255 that's also a, a, another register you can have you can stop it's called PR2 I think maybe it's not uh, correct but then your clock will only run here and then it will repeat <clears throat> and the thing is that this is zero CPU usage it's completely independent once you set these values it just runs and runs and runs uh, I forgot to say that the timer can be 60 bits as uh, well. We have a uh, one 8 bit timer and two 16 bit timer in this microcontroller. So let's get back to uh, timer interrupts. Two interrupts. Oops. In 20 milliseconds. And that's not too bad for a microcontroller because let's say you're running at 1 megahertz. And you want 50 hertz of interrupts, uh, or 20, every 20 milliseconds, you have way much time left for anything else in your program. So, um, so in your service routine, that is called, every time you get an interrupt, you will check first. If you have other interrupts, you have to check which one it is. So uh, it's called uh, IF, and uh, that means the timer interrupt flag. So if the flag is high, then you have to reset it because it doesn't do that itself. That's the first thing you do <laughs> when you have this flag. Then the program will get into this uh, here, and you reset it. So that you can get another interrupt later. And then you just check if your uh, output is high or low. You don't check if it's equal 1 or 0, just say if out. So if it's high, then the program will get in here. And then you set the output to 0. And as we talked about earlier, we want uh, let's no, uh, remember now we are here right and now we want it to get here somewhere we want another interrupt later then therefore we set or we add we add the timer one period minus let's say one and a half millisecond right so now if uh, our timer ha has come here before we are actually servicing it, it will jump here. Right? So you don't lose any time in that timer. And that's basically it. And if it was zero, without was zero, just write else. We do the same here. Out equals one. And timer, timer. Zero plus equal. It should say zero here, by the way. Um, equals period 
I don't have enough space, I just write period and then let's say 19 milliseconds. It doesn't have to be exactly 20 milliseconds though. So. And you have to close all these closes. So. so, that's basically what's happening there. There'll be um, no jitter. So if you are concerned with jitter, like we have here, if there's an interrupt, you don't know if you get an extra delay in your in your delay because whenever you sit, you um, your program is stuck in a delay, and there comes an interrupt, the delay will be a bit longer. So um, here you don't have the jitter, but you have some some overhead. But uh, but okay for 50 hertz so now and the, the last one uh, I did research this and at 50 hertz they didn't recommend this because you had to uh, compromise your CPU speed so it was set to 8 megahertz but I had to get down to 1 megahertz because uh, I couldn't get the f low frequency without doing so. So uh, anyway, it was no, no. Uh, it isn't a problem for me to have 1 megahertz for this. So, so let's take a look at uh, what we had before. So what we had before was. Um, it's a comparator peripheral that you can set a specific point in your timer and when it this compares with the timer zero then uh, when this CCP 1L compares to this free running timer it's free running, it's just running and running then you get a, a waveform out and by adjusting this CCP1L you can actually you can set the width here and another thing is that um, you lose a lot of resolution because in our case since this is like 20 milliseconds now and we're only using one to two milliseconds. So you can see that if uh, the resolution looks like this, we are losing a lot of uh, ticks here for one to two milliseconds. But we, we are going to use a uh, 16 bit timer. Oh, sorry, 10 bit timer. 10 bit timer. So we'll be fine, but it's not perfect though, so, um, yeah. I'll put up a block diagram that you can find in the datasheet for this microcontroller, PIC16F887. And then you can see already on the screen that uh, you have on the top there, you'll find the guts of the CPU. And to the right of it, or the right of the data bus, you have all this put A, B, C, and D, or E, in this case. And if you move <coughs> further down, you have something called CCP2. <coughs> CCP2. And that's called Capture and Compare. So you can configure it at PVM. And you can, cap, um, you can select how it will work. So for this task, we have selected it to work as in PWM. So yeah, and, the, and uh, you can see the crossed box, and you can also see them to the right of the port. So these are pins. So actually this is a pin, it's directly connected to a pin. So. And the other diagram I wanted to show you. Yeah, and the two other diagrams I wanted to show you is a simplified PWM block diagram. So this is the CCP module that is set. To run as a PWM, and uh, you can already see there we talked about these registers. So you, here you have the comparator, comparator, 
and you can see on one side you have the CCPR value that you can set on the other side you have the free running timer so whenever the timer matches the value you have set in CCPR then uh, this um, device and next this flip-flop will then reset and whenever that resets you can see that it's uh, directly connected to the CCPX pin and the X is for one or two because there are two, two of this model so in our case it will be CCP2 I think I have to check that out but uh, anyway it doesn't matter and uh, you can also see that there's something else there whenever the timer 2 there's a second convert parameter here so whenever that timer 2 is also not only equal to CCPR L or high, but it's equal to PR2, then it will then uh, clear this, this area and then the output will then change. So, as you saw in my diagram earlier, and I'll show you now, mm -hmm. you see here yeah, that the timer runs freely. Whenever it passes, timer secret is a CCP1L, then the output changes. And then whenever timer 2 equals PR2, then it, it will reset the timer to zero and also change the output because of that flip-flop. And the second diagram is called CCP PVM output. And uh, there you can see how the waveform will look like. And also you see that at the beginning there's timer 2 equals zero. And the pulse width is then determined by timer 2 equals the CCPR register. And the full period equals timer 2 equals PR2. So that's what we were talking about here. So, so I hope that was uh, easy enough. So I'll try to explain it uh, in, uh, as uh, slow as possible. <laughs> yeah, so back to the PWM then. So now we have talked about that. So it uses one timer, one CCP uh, module, or X, only 10 bit resolution used for PWM. So, yeah doesn't use the full 16 bits though. Yeah, and uh, how much CPU usage? That's the fun part. It's actually zero. And that's why I want to use it, even though it's uh, not really recommended for this project because the, the speed is so slow. And therefore I have to... I, I had to compromise. I had to set the... Uh, CPU or the frequency of the CPU to 1 megahertz to make it work and then also since you only have 10 bits you don't get that very fine steps that you could have had if you use this this uh, here so because then you can you can run your timer much faster yeah and if you run it faster, you have a high resolution in that 1 to 2 millisecond range. <coughs> because then you get more ticks. Yes. So, enough about servo signaling. So let's move on to the next stage. And that's the... Um, this actually uses the same module, but uh, because we have two of these, we use another model. So here, this is in compare in PWM mode right <clears throat> but for the ultrasonic distance sensor we are going to use it in a capture mode so let's have a look at that So the thing here is that the transducer sends us one beep and it travels this way 
so it's one pulse. And whenever it hits an object, it will be reflected back. And then eventually you will have a pulse there. And then you can measure time. So the total time is to take to anyway, doesn't matter. Yeah. Imagine you send the pulse there. So so this is what comes in with the trick. But right? And then when that pulse comes back again. And has traveled all the way here. Then the envelope of this pulse or the edge will go down. So here it goes up and then it goes down again. And it stays down until you trigger it again. And what I saw is was that uh, if I triggered it again too early, it wouldn't respond to me anymore. So uh, it cancels out anything that comes later. I think the thing is that uh, well, this is this goes the same for radios. If you send out a radio wave it will bounce off like walls for example so you will have some something going down here and then up again and then you will get a signal and so the receiver will get a signal here I think but it will also get some for, from the reflected signal because it takes longer for it to travel like this. And also there is stuff behind this object so uh, so it will then trigger many times. So you have a band here that you want to cancel out. So therefore I don't think you can um, you can't trigger it before this this uh, module has a capture module. So you have a pin here on your microcontroller. So it's called uh, CCPX. I think it's CCP2 or 1. So I called it X here. <clears throat> and the thing is, if you, when, if you set this um, CCP module, the same one we use for PWM, but we are using it for the capture mode now. So if you set it to capture, you will go into a uh, device here called the prescaler scaler and that is something you can configure to prescale by 1 so there is no prescaling or by 4 or by 16 so you can see that on the screen now we have this um, this model here so I will just redraw it and then let's say we are Prescaling by four, you have to have four pulses in here, and then you get one pulse out. That's uh, how it works. Nothing uh, more than that. But si since we are configuring it for uh, one here, so we only get one pulse in, then uh, then this this signal will just pass through. <clears throat> and the second module here is a, uh, a detector. Uh, you can configure it. Can show you on the screen. Oh, it's a quite a, <laughs> it's a register called CCP2 con. So so it's uh, CCP2 then, right? CCP2 con. It's a uh, control register, and uh, you use bit three to zero in that register. And as you can see on the screen now, uh, there's four bits. If you set it to capture mode, you have a, uh, um, you can capture every falling edge, every rising edge, every fourth rising edge and uh, every sixteenth rising edge. So this, so here when the um, pulse is rising we can call that event A and this when the echo arrives we then call this uh, B, event B. So for event A we want to capture the rising edge right and for B we want to capture the 
falling itch. So I have to do this in software. We have to wait for this. And when this has happened, we have to reconfigure this module to falling itch. So, what else can this module do? Well, as you also saw, there was more stuff in here. So whenever this event occurs, you get an interrupt flag. So this is CCP2 interrupt flag, such that uh, you can then uh, interrupt the CPU and then service this event. But that's not all. There's more stuff happening here. There's another register up here. Let's say this is uh, this is a buffer, and you have a register here. It's uh, two bytes, and it's called CCP R two high and CCP two R low. So this is a 16-bit wide uh, register, and what's that? Uh, isn't that interesting? Because you have your timer here, it's running. 16 bit timer, so you have a timer to high. No, it's timer 1 actually. Timer 1 low. So, what's happening here? You can see here that when this event happens, the value in this free running timer, remember, it's free running, it's this clock, right? So it just runs and runs and runs. So let's draw it here. So here you have the zero interrupt for the timer, but that's the interrupt for the timer. But now you have events that happen arbitrarily around this. So, and also remember, this is running freely, it doesn't have anything to do with the code. So whatever is happening in the code, it doesn't care at all. When this happens, um, the CCPR, CCPR registers, high and low, equals timer 1, high low. Same here. C, C, P, R, I, or low equals timer 1, I, or low. So, we need to get this value out of this register and store it in memory before it is... or uh, before it goes uh, another round, because... Big deal. <coughs> so let's see the CPU is uh, taking some time, so let's say the interrupt routine is uh, here. And then uh, the A is stored, it doesn't matter, it's already captured. That's why it's called capture, because you capture this value. It doesn't matter where you take it out, as long as you take it out before the next one. And uh, this uh, happens probably <laughs> very fast, so it's no problem. But the thing is, it is captured, so if your timing is very supposed to be very precise, you have to have a, a high resolution um, capture or something, like a... Uh, yeah, let's say you want to uh, synchronize to a GPS GPS satellite, for the, because they have a um, atom clock a new atom clock and that uh, has such a uh, very precise clock now and if you want to synchronize to that, you, you wouldn't want to capture it within a very small time frame, no jitter, so yeah. There you go, so what do we do in code then? So the first thing you do, you say uh, capture rising edge and wait. So the code will then, uh, okay, so now we are halting the processor, but it's okay because this uh, period here is not that uh, long now. So, you know, this signals, uh, this uh, audio signal will transfer pretty fast, so in a short distance. 
and uh, it waits, and then this uh, event happens. And then a little time later, this interrupt will be serviced. So what you do then, you store a. Right, so you store the value from from C C P R high and low. Right? So now you have stored it in memory. And this is a 16-bit value, so you need to have a 16-bit variable in your memory. And then you will continue to wait for falling edge. So you're waiting here. Right, and then this event happens, and then later you will then have another flag. Okay, so you have to reset reset uh, interrupt flag uh, ccp2if so reset that if you don't reset it you won't capture the next one, next one so so what's happening here we store a we reset the interrupt flag we have to wait for falling edge that means that we have to write to ccp2com to zero and set that to what was it say falling edge that's zero one zero zero and up here it will be rising edge that's zero one zero one that's what the register ccp colon has to be so then now it will then wait for that and you can use a while loop to do that so while the flag is not high we'll just stick around and B happens, we get an interrupt, and the, the value B is then stored until we service it. So then we store B from C, the same register, super R, J, L, L. and then uh, reset the interrupt flag, right? Then, um, and then the return. Then you can return to the service uh, subroutine, whatever it was running before. So that's basically it. And uh, we will look at the code later in the next uh, video because um, this is a bit uh, tricky.